the Saritsa, the Cryo Archon. Who exactly does she love? And how on earth did she come to meet Piero? And what exactly is their relationship? This video will be about the Cryo Archon and about Piero. Their partnership and what it actually means. Is Piero pulling the strings behind everything we see, sort of like a Jafar from Aladdin, or are they genuinely mutual in their goals? First, let's talk about the Saritsa though, and how it's been heavily, heavily hinted at for a long time now that she represents the Pale Princess in the book The Pale Princess and the Six Pygmies. The Six Pygmies representing the other Archons, obviously. And everything we know about the Saritsa, if you put in parallel with that book, she fell in love with someone from Conria who shared his knowledge of alchemy and technology and encouraged her to seek a kingdom without an influence of Celestia. The six pygmies are the other Archons who for various reasons enable the destruction of Conria, which we know that's already been hinted by with her disapproval of Venti, Zhengli's guilt, all the PTSD the Archons actually have. Because right off the bat, this gives her a much bigger, deeper connection to Conria. If she loved someone from Conria, that means that her lover, their nation died, possibly her lover as well. We don't know who this is, but this would explain why the Sarita was much more devastated by this whole conflict than the rest of the Archons, and why she despises the other Archons now. And obviously with Lisa's first little quest, the Abyss Mage hints at the importance of this book and why Lisa seems so adamant at getting it back. And what actually are the Archons? They were given authority of a sovereign and expected to rule over one of the seven nations, working for Celestia. However, none of the Archons fully seem to enjoy this or even want to be doing this to begin with. Bad things and bad prophecies seem to happen if you step out of line. And in this book, it sort of suggests that the prince in this book was promising the princess, the pale princess, a way out of this. Conria also represents the nation who wasn't under Celestia's heel and promising to take this princess to the moon and beyond the moonlight, which represents a land outside of Celestia's control that they can make things grow and make people stronger. This hints towards alchemy, abyssal powers, and forbidden knowledge in their technology could be making people stronger. The prince and the princess fall in love, and travel together to reach their goal. This also fits the theme of the Saritsa being the god of love, not just because she fell in love with a prince from Conria, but because she used to love her people very much, guide them, and once her heart was broken, this all fell apart. In the book, the princess tells the pygmies, which are the other archons, to come with her to the kingdom of light. She says this is a place that can bring sight to the blind, wisdom to the foolish, courage to the timid. Basically, it's the promised land. She's trying to introduce her fellow colleagues, if you would call it that, her other fellow archons, to something better, to follow her in this path, to reach enlightenment, to get outside of the heel of Celestia. But the prince and the princess are betrayed. The pygmies start to scheme because of their fears and they're not totally sold on this idea. So ultimately betray the Pale Princess or the Archons betraying the Saritsa and decide to stick with Celestia or the status quo. And I find it funny that the destruction of Conria is such a vague thing that happened in Genshin's past, but the Saritsa has no mention of it so far actually participating in this war. We know that Venti was there, we know that Zhongli was there, we know the Hydro and Electro Archons perished during that war. Ruka Devada had to save Ermensal and helped keep the life force of Egeria grounded to the lands of Teyvat. Where was the Cryo Archon? If you go by the book, the Pale Princess was distracted, and I bet that Saritsa was as well, and the Prince was tortured. So Conria being destroyed while the Saritsa was distracted or away, unable to help. The Prince's torture could be many things, it probably involves him having to actually watch the destruction of his own nation. The fact that the other Archons are pretty remorseful now and have a crap ton of PTSD and just seemed shaken up, don't really want to talk about it, makes it more believable that maybe they did betray the Saritsa, because she cut ties with all of them. I don't think just watching a nation full of godless people alone would be enough for the god of love to say, yeah that's it. She obviously had some more stakes in this. This was obviously much more personal to her than that. Now there are a lot of ways you can interpret these events, but I think it's safe to say that the Saritsa is probably not in the Heavenly Principles best books right now. And if you're the Saritsa, we know what happened to King Deshert for rebelling, 
and defying Celestia, Ageria for just making Fontanian Oceanids into people, there's repercussions for actions. In the Saritza's perspective, she is enslaved, and she knows that Shaznaya can be wiped out at any time. There's a meteor metaphorically hanging over their heads that could crash land there any time. In the trailer, they say she has no love left for her people and that she no longer really cares, because she fully understands now that there is no hope for them or ascending. If they truly wish to find out if there's a kingdom of light that exists outside of Tivat, they have to destroy Celestia first. It's the only chance. So this is why it's her singular goal. And the Night Mother in this book represents Celestia. Maybe it's the Heavenly Principles, the Sustainer, we're not sure who's who. The Night Mother tells the Pygmies and that she's destroyed the Moonlight Kingdom. The Moonlight Kingdom representing Conria and cursed the Pale Princess's people. She explains the people will be in an undead state lingering between life and death with no soul and no moonlight. That sounds exactly like the Heavenly Principles being the Night Mother cursing Conrians with immortality, some of them being monsters and some of them just like Dainsliff or Piero having straight immortality, having to watch their home burn down to the ground and now here we are. You could even use moonlight in this story as a metaphor for hope. Maybe that's the Saritza's punishment. And the Night Mother actually tells one of the pygmies a prophecy. And this pygmy is devastated and full of regret. So he hides the prince's body in a tree somewhere and walks off in exile. This sounds a lot like Zheng Li. He still feels indebted to the Saritza and wants to make things right. So now that the moment has come, he takes the chance to make a new deal with her and arranges his departure from Liyue and gives the Gnosis away in order to begin his exile. Exactly like the pygmy did in the book. The prophecy that he was told by the Night Mother, in a thousand years, my greatest foe will descend. He wields a sword that heralds the dawn and wears armor that can reflect the shining sunlight. He shall destroy my kingdom and bring the prince back to life. The princess will then be free from her external torment. Until then I fear not a single soul in the land of night. For nothing will bring an end to my kingdom except for the catastrophe to unfold by the prophecy. As for you, the treacherous slave, fate shall see that you get what you deserve. And the way that this prophecy actually reads, and somebody actually did comment this on my last Saritza video as well, but that in the Battle Pass trailer, Queen of the Kingdom of Darkness sounds a lot like the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles, and then the Prince to take up the journey where the first left off sounds a lot like Danesliff. And obviously this foe that will descend in the prophecy represents the Travelers. You pick one that's playable, but it represents the Travelers, which is probably why the Saritza, knowing this prophecy, starts to make her move for the Gnosis from each Archon as we become part of the algorithm, part of the equation. Obviously this book is meant to show us or tell us something more than it actually is. It's supposed to be a fairy tale that this Abyss Mage steals from Lisa, but obviously it alludes to something much greater. I don't think the timelines and every specific detail is spot on. I think it's very loosely based on the exact events of Tevat and what is happening. Obviously, it's more than what we think, because the Abyss Mage reveals that there's a secret hidden to this book, and Lisa seems to know. I actually made a video talking about this not that long about how Lisa actually is much more than we realize, and why she knows about this book. But not to get too off topic, what does that tell us about the Prince? Well, there's a few options that the Prince could be, but his main characteristics are someone that has knowledge and sought after the Kingdom of Light, that he was able to improve the people's lives through alchemy and technology, and that he incurred the Saritza in defying Celestia. Having been betrayed, he would have even more reason to hate the Archons in the story. He was poisoned, tortured, left somewhere, and is prophesied to be brought back to life by Celestia's foe. Overall, it sounds to me like it definitely is somebody from Conria, so here are our options. Options. Dainsliff is obviously a clear choice since he actually awoke from the cataclysm, the same place where the big battle took place and the Hydro Archon Ageria's remains are. That is where him and the Abyss Twin actually started their journey. He traveled with the Abyss Twin for a while, which might be how he had confirmed knowledge of lands away from Celestia. His behavior is currently full of contradictions. He tries to avoid the Knights of Avonius and the Church, and the gods for that matter, but he also walks around Mondstadt and hanging out in Diluc's tavern, where Venti is known to be. Maybe he thinks they won't recognize him, but we know that Genshin's full of these misdirections. Piero the Jester, in his relationship with the Saritza, 
He's the first of the Fatui Harbingers, and now he's the director. He was recruited 500 years ago according to the Pale Flame Artifact set, and he's obviously from Conran, and he was in conflict with the nation's leaders. And maybe he convinced the Tsaritsa to follow him in the same path. And if she truly loved him, it would explain why he's been able to puppet master this whole thing, and maybe he's the brains behind all of this. But we'll get into Piero more in a second, because his relationship with the Tsaritsa still stands, whether he's the prince in the scenario or not, because they are working together. The third option is obviously somebody we haven't met yet. I speculate maybe even somebody like Kaya's father or someone of royal blood obviously. This seems likely it could be an actual prince of Conria, someone from a royal family who could therefore be related to Kaya. But I don't think it would be Kaya himself considering he arrived in Mondstadt as a boy teenager. But for his father, because he was adopted by Diluc's parents and actually doesn't have a family of his own, maybe his father was the prince who was tortured and poisoned in this story. Maybe his father truly does represent the prince who was poisoned and taken out. Which is why he has a very important role into this as well. By God. Could he even be the Cryo Archon's son? Could the prince and the Pale Princess had a child? What the? That's it. That's it. Nah, that can't be. I mean, he does have a Cryo Vision. Nah. No, come on. I'm just playing. Well, I don't know. Can can Archons have children with people? I don't know. These are questions for another day. But let us talk about Piero now. If the th first three Harbingers are as strong as the gods, then it's safe to at least assume that Piero is ballpark power level to that of an Archon. He's the Lord Commander of the Fatui organization. Him and the Saritza must have formed a bond of some sort sometime after Conria's destruction if he is not in fact the prince. An interesting detail about La Senora's funeral scene is that Piero was the one shown playing chess not the Saritza. It would seem that he is in control of this whole plan. He is the master on the chessboard, controlling and playing with the Gnosis as pieces on the board. This is like a subtle detail, but it sort of implies that he's the one that's organizing and orchestrating all of this. And I do believe he is manipulating the Saritza, whether he's the prince or not. Which makes me believe that he's not the prince in the story, but she still could love him. She is the god of love after all. And if you just had your heart torn out, Piero could be somewhat of a rebound, in a sense. Something to fill the void. And Piero seems to know exactly how to manipulate this. Taking advantage of her grief, and knowing the right things to say, in order to push her buttons in the right ways, to get what he wants, and to establish everything he wants to accomplish. This is of course my speculation, but think about it this way. If the Saritza was the Pale Princess, and her plans with the Prince to get out underneath Celestia's heel, but Conria went up in flames, everything went wrong that it could, the Saritza is unequivocally heartbroken, devastated. Piero, wanting revenge for what had happened to his homeland and Conria, the Six Pygmies or the Archon's betrayal of the Saritza and the destruction of Conria, and losing her Prince, this would have the Saritza, the God of Love, and the most hysterically heartbroken scenario where she would unequivocally throw herself at the jester who promises to rectify this, get revenge, seize authority from the gods. I don't really know what the technical word is for it, but you know when somebody just lost the love of their life and then they quickly throw themselves at somebody else really fast? The worst version of a rebound and that somebody being also from Conria that can promise you everything that you want to do and accomplish now. That is what Piero represents to me. In the right place at the right time, also knowing how to manipulate this situation. Which is why the Harbingers and the Fatui in general are not very ethical in their mission. They do a lot of really crappy things and Piero's recruited some of the most notorious individuals all across Tevat to form the Eleven. He's taking advantage of a heartbroken, devastated Saritza, and a Saritza who wants revenge on the other Archons, on the whole world. And that new relationship is somebody that's taking advantage of your grief and your loss by telling you everything you want to know and hear to rectify this and do everything that you want to see done. Piero is a master manipulator. Sit at the helm of the Fatui, the strongest military in all of Tevat, 
having people and individuals that are as strong as gods and probably archons at his disposal, and he's the one playing the chess game. I think his reasons for wanting to get seizing authority from the gods, the archons, and everything, abolishing Celestia, obviously makes sense. But who is Piero exactly? Well, we don't know. We know he's a royal mage, but is he something more? And what does he want to do with the third descender? Does the Saritza even know about this descender? These are all questions we don't have answers to. And as somebody in the comments pointed out to me, it does seem a little bit interesting that in the Battle Pass cutscene, it depicts the Queen of Darkness and then the second prince, the second throne, coming down and taking up where the first one left off. Sort of represents when Dainsliff says in the trailer, Step forth if you have understood the meaning of your journey. Defeat me. Command me to step aside. Show me that you are worthier than I to rescue her. Then, the threads of all fate will be yours to reweave. We all assume this is about Lumine, which it could still be technically, but why would he say a specific line about her if we could be either the male or female character as a playable character. Because the main MC is interchangeable, it would seem more likely that this would make more sense if he was talking about the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles. Just something to note. But I'm going to wrap the video up there. I don't want this to be an hour long. I do hope you enjoyed the video though. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. That is why I love this game so much. The story runs so deep. And there's so many possibilities, so many little easter eggs that we got early on in the game that didn't mean much at the time. But as we get further along, oh boy do they really start to mean something. 4.6 just around the corner which means we might get a new Archon quest with Dainsliff, our Lakinos dropping which is exciting. But on that note, thank you so much for watching, hope you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this. I do appreciate y'all watching this far and helping the channel grow. And as always, we will see you all in the next one. Later.